Hey everybody, welcome back to Airsoftology Mondays, the show that answers your questions, helps you out in a pinch, and is also enjoying a very rainy, gloomy afternoon of filming here. I'm your host, Jonathan Eggs. That's right, it has been raining all weekend long. I wanted to get out and didn't, so it's been work all weekend, which is good. Anyway, welcome back to the show. If it's your first time here, it's super simple how it works. You put your comment in the comment section below, you vote up your favorites, and then they get on the show. I do dig deep as well, so they don't always have to be the highest rated comment on here. Also, if you guys don't know, I do have a web store and a Patreon to help out support this whole thing and keep the machine going and free for you and keep me creating. All of that goes back into this, actually the business here. It doesn't actually go for you know fun stuff and trips and things like that. So if you guys wanna support, I do have a web store full of patches and all kinds of cool stuff, and then also that Patreon. I've got links to both of those below as well. But enough of me hawking all the wares and all this stuff, let's dive on into what you're really here for, and that's your questions in the Tipman Mail Call. Kermit the Frogger writes, Airsoft game would be cool where everybody is using a wooden looking bolt action rifle. That would be cool. I've actually always wanted to do like a full on World War II type setup or even a World War I, but that would really limit your options in airsoft for guns and things like that. But I do like the whole wooden bolt action uh, rifle idea that would kind of harken back to the Springfield Model 1898s and 1901s and, and things along those lines. And of course there'd be Mosin Nagants. Is there an airsoft? I don't think there's an airsoft Mosin Nagant, probably because it would cost more than a real Mosin Nagant. Hmm, something to think about. Anyway, that and all the cool stuff. And if you wanted to run support, maybe you'd run a BAR or something big and beefy like that and just give a few people that full auto awesomeness that could be that and really limit the support guns. I think that would be cool. I know there was a gas blowback only game or has been a series of them called Project Reality in the Southern California, United States area. And it's happened many times, um, but I've never seen like a bolt action rifle thing. I think that really lives, like limits what you can have. Like I, I'm thinking like G&G's got some really good options like um, the Car 98 and things like that. But I can't really think of too many other companies. I mean, you have to go with like uh, M14s and a few others. I don't know. In fact, you know what? Let me ask you guys what your favorite wooden stock bolt action looking single or semi-auto rifle would be. And would you want to do an arrow one or maybe just stick with anything that has that look to it and you could run with it? Put your ideas in the comment section below. I'd love to see what you guys have in mind for some kind of wooden or bolt action rifle kind of game setup. FitFam writes, hey Jonathan, how do you feel about Heelys in Airsoft, preferably Speedsoft? Well, we're talking Heelys, those crazy looking shoes with the wheels in the heel. I think it would be terrible uh, idea. First off, the fact, I, I think it'd be cool. You mean you could move fast. I think that's what you're kind of aiming for here is the ability to actually go quickly and move fast. However, I don't think you're going to have a good time. Just off the top of my head, I do not own a pair of Heelys, but I think Heelys plus BBs on the ground could cause jams. I think it seems like they've kind of got gaps in them enough to cause that problem. That's why I wouldn't do it. Plus Heelys, like there's not much clearance, so you'd hit some BBs and then you maybe go lateral, side meaning sideways, and I just think it'd be a bad idea. Asking for a serious, serious wipeout. It would be almost as bad as an idea to do one of those, that or then those like hoverboard things that were popular that caught fire. Like all of them started burning up because of the lithium batteries a couple years back. I think that's probably pretty high on the bad idea list as well. But yeah, those are kind of my thoughts on that. I mean, it's kind of a neat idea. I think in concept, especially if like seed speed soft, I could see the benefits, but I just think with BBs in the ground and the way airsoft fields are made, like chipboard and I, it's just asking for trouble. Colin Harold writes, hey Jonathan, this is probably a really dumb question, especially considering I've been playing for over seven years, being both a weekender and sponsored, but what exactly is a high cap? Are they just blinged and modded 1911s or is there more to the magic? Thanks. There's actually more to the magic here. A high kappa is kind of another way of saying a 2011 pistol, 2011. It is a specific style of pistol that is the reason they're called high cap is they're high capacity or high cap. I think that's kind of where it came from. Don't quote me on that, but it sounds about right. It is a high capacity 1911 style pistol. I think STI was one of the first companies to make it, the original one uh, in the real world. And they are double stacked 1911s. They are wider, they are thicker, they are bigger, and they hold more bullets. If you know a traditional 1911 holds, was it seven plus one? 
Is it 7 plus 1 or 8 plus 1? On a 1911 in 45 caliber. That is all you get. I think it's 7 plus 1. Um, meaning 7 in the magazine, 1 in the chamber, and the high kappa, it greatly expands that to a larger capacity pistol, giving you more rounds in the real world. I think it's in the high 20s. It almost doubles it because it becomes a double stack, and they, they kind of go in there. Don't quote me on that. I'll have to look it up. I'm kind of shooting from the hip on this one here, but I do know a little bit of the history of this. So that's what you're talking about, a high kappa. They are very favorites of airsofters because that big fat magazine gives you a ton of BBs, a larger gas well, which is usually the Achilles heel or the weak spot of a 1911. It's a really thin magazine. It does not hold a lot of gas. Um, and for whatever reason, I guess because of that, and years and years and years ago, people started modding the Tokyo Maruis and they became a fan favorite. Now you see them modded, tapped, and all kinds of big stuff. I think just because of the, the capacity, the magwell and all that, or the magazine size, for the gas to be in there, the gas reservoir, uh, just all lent to a good platform to start building off of. Plus, since it's a non-licensed platform, you can just get them a blank slate. You don't have to worry about paying licensing for another big brand name like HK Glock, uh, Smith & Wesson, or something along those lines. So I think that's kind of really what makes them super popular. I know that wasn't part of your questions asking about the popularity, but just a little history in Airsoft. And I think because of that, the Speedsoft crowd has picked them up. I have a lot of friends that are huge into high kappa modding, and they, uh, they're they way better at than I am. Gas blowbacks, especially the pistols, are probably one of my lesser skills when it comes to airsoft. I'm much more of an AEG tech kind of guy when it comes to things like that. But yeah, I think the high kappa is a fantastic platform. A lot of people use it because of that, and uh, that's kind of the history behind the pistol platform. Timothy Neumeyer writes, is it bad to put different weight BBs in your mags? Ah. I guess bad could be it. Not a good idea. I think that's probably a better way to say it. It's not a good idea to put different weight BBs. And here's why. When you set, put BBs in your magazine, you're gonna set your hop up based on the BB weight. Meaning if you put 0.25 gram BBs in there, you're gonna set your hop up and the BBs are gonna fly nice and straight when you get the hop up set correctly, as far as they can go before they kind of float down and die out. When you mix BB weights, let's say 0 0.20 gram, 0.25 grams, and 0 0.30 grams, we mix all three of those in there, the three O's are going to go a little less distant and drop off, kind of sharp, boom, not enough hop up. The point two O's are gonna fly out and go like a rocket ship up to the moon uh, and then kind of fizzle away and go above your target. When you mix weights, any weight that is typically heavier or significantly heavier, which even 0.2 gram, 0 0.02 grams can make a big difference. Going from like 0.23 to a 0.25 or a 0.25 to a 0.28, uh, which is a 3.03 .03 gram jump, those can make a big difference. So any BB that is heavier than the weight you have your hop up set for is gonna drop off sooner. Any BB that is lighter is normally going to take off and go to the moon or over hop, meaning it's gonna fly and then it's gonna kind of do this little thing and then kind of poop down, like the visual representation of that. Kind of like a heartbeat and it goes out, then it dies off. So that's it, you have under hop, which means falls off early, and over hop, which means it kind of does the vertical thing. So yeah, that's why it's not a good idea to really do it. You're just gonna have a lot of inaccuracies and it just makes no benefit. Is it gonna hurt you to mix them in there, like break the gun? Nah, it won't do that at all. It's gonna make it really hard for you to hit your enemy and that's kind of gonna be a pain and frustration for you. The Watcher Plays writes, Hey Jonathan, I was about to buy a SEMA VSR-10 and was wondering, should I save up for a TM VSR-10? Okay, so I did some research on this. I've never owned a SEMA VSR-10. I have had a couple JG Bar 10s and some Marui VSR-10s. Um, those are all the same platform. They are all VSR-10 compatible, meaning you can use standard Tokyo Marui VSR-10 parts in any of those guns. But on my research, and this is as of not too long ago, I was had to dig deep and, and look for a lot of photos. To me, it seems that the SEMA VSR-10 rifle has on the back of the cylinder, and this is why I would say avoid, maybe not make the purchase if you plan on making upgrades to it and actually boosting the power in stock format you won't have any trouble. The back where the actual bolt handle mates to the cylinder, the part that you grab and pull back, is crimped on, meaning it's got some areas and the metal is just kind of bent in to hold that in place. On higher power upgrades, you're gonna end up, over time, you can end up possibly pulling that bolt part off the back of the cylinder. That is something that could really happen. On the Marui, you're not gonna have that issue, but the cylinder is a lesser metal than the SEMA. The SEMA does have a metal, a good metal cylinder from what I understand, from what I've been doing my research. My experience, the reason the VSR-10 or the JG Bar-10 
by JG is one of the most popular ones is you get a steel cylinder which is really reinforced and it's pinned on like the Tokyo Rui. And there's metal pins in place rather than being crimped. Those pins are not going to come out. It's gonna give you a stronger cylinder where that bolt mates. The reason you want that is when you start putting bigger springs in there, getting it up to let's say 550 feet per second, if that's what's allowed at your field and doing constant time over time shots or even harder if your field allows that, you could eventually take the back off because it's really hard to pull the thing back and you know after time you're gonna end up you know wearing that thing out. In stock form, not a problem. In upgraded form, you're gonna be in a better place and that's one less part you have to buy when you get the JG Bar 10 and price-wise, I think they're within 10 US dollars of each other so I would definitely save and make the lateral move to the JG Bar 10 for that reason. All of them are gonna have slight fitment issues and until you get, even a Rui VSR 10 admittedly has some fitment issues with aftermarket parts, a little bit of modding. I found that JG has a bit more fitment issues, meaning you're gonna have to do a little bit more work in some cases, especially if you wanna change the entire trigger package. I ran into that personal problem when I upgraded the sear inside of the trigger I had to do a little bit of filing and modding just to make it fit with a certain brand that I picked. But aside from that, everything else dropped in. I was using actually a Novrich tuning kit on that build. On Tokyo Marui, the TM, you're gonna have a better bet uh, on it across the board, but you will have to make that investment on a upgraded cylinder if you're going to high power or if you're gonna do some big drop-in kit, it's not gonna matter. Anyway, I know it's kind of a long uh, answer to a short question, but I hope that helps in picking out a good platform if you want to upgrade a VSR-10 sniper rifle. All right, guys, that is it for questions this week, which means it is time for the Code Red Headsets video recommendation of the week. And this one comes from me. Um, it's actually somebody I recommended a handful of weeks ago, maybe about a month and a half, two months ago. And I want to bring him back up again because he's back with gameplay, finally bringing back the gameplay, not just the, hey, I'm back, guys, with a funny video. It is Robo Murray, better known as Robo Airsoft, better known as Rob Murray, and he's back with Operation Copperhead 3, starting the gameplay series part one. At first I started watching, I was like, oh great, they're just stuck in a house, but the tension builds. I'm telling you, I got sucked in, heart started racing a little bit even on some parts, and I just got taken back, and I tell you, I love Robo, I love his narration he puts over top of this, he kind of gives you some thought of what's going on, and that's always what he's done when the moments are, when he's playing, so you're not just, you know, kind of watching some gameplay. He's kind of saying, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's why I'm doing this. Here's what I'm thinking at the time. And of course, uh, I just love the way his, he does everything. He's always active and going crazy and transitioning from primaries to pistols and all kinds of good stuff. Tons of grenades. And a plus, it's with my buddies in the video. You got Matt and you got uh, actually Dave from Airsoft Obsessed, Matt from Evic. Uh, it's just a cool crowd of dudes. So anyway, guys, if you want to check it out, definitely give it a look. It is Robo's Pew Pew Time, which is what he calls his gameplay. And it's always have a link in the description below so you guys can click it and check it out. And if you haven't subbed to Robo's channel, I just say definitely, if you guys like Airsoft gameplay, just hit the sub button. He's gonna be back with this series and then check his back catalog. He's got a lot of really, really good stuff out there. And he's doing a lot of real still shooting if you guys are into that. He's actually pretty darn good too. So anyway, that's it. I'll have it all down there below for you so you guys can mash it. Oh, and if you do go over there, let him know I sent you. Well, everybody, that's it for this week. Thank you so much, as always, for coming and hanging out and being so cool in the comment section. I can't answer every question, like I say, every week, uh, but you guys do such a great job taking care of each other down there in that community, and that's what I love, uh, that we have this community, this group of people that are all of us as airsoftology people or airsoftologists, I guess. I guess we all are. Anyway, until next week, go out, play some airsoft, have some fun, but no matter what you do, call your freaking hits.